afternoon. You're watching Updates at Noon with me, Renee Fong. Making the headlines today, proposal of EPF savings as collateral for bank loans is not against the law. KKD supports efforts to bring virtual production equipment into the country. The Day One Rakyat today was told that the proposal to allow employees Provident Fund EPF savings as collateral for bank loans, not against Section 51 of the EPF Act. Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim said the government has referred to the EPF and the Attorney General to get legal advice on the matter. Tentunya, dari segi penasihat undang-undang, KWSP, dan Peguam Negara telah dirojok dan tidak ada percanggahan uh, dengan Seksi 51. Walau bagaimanapun, dari sudut um, jaminan uh, kepentingan uh, peminjam, itu dipelihara. Umpamanya, uh, tidak ada uh, dividen akan diteruskan. Walaupun dia beri cagaran, uh, umpamanya RM50,000 itu uh, sebagai uh, pinjaman, tetapi dividen itu akan diberikan sepenuh ikut kumpulan asal, jadi tidak dipotong. Datuk Sri Anwar, who is also the Minister of Finance, was speaking in the Dewan Rakyat during the Prime Minister question time this morning. Previously on 9th March, Datuk Sri Anwar announced that the government agreed to allow EPF savings to be used as collateral for bank loans applications. Meanwhile, Datuk Sri Anwar also revealed that Bagan MP Lim Guan Eng did not revoke Yaya San Al Bukhari's tax exemption. The Prime Minister said accusations claiming Lim had done so during his tenure as Finance Minister during the Pakatan Harapan PH administration were not true. Maka dakwaan yang dibuat bahawa beliau membatalkan pengecualian adalah tidak benar. Itu um, Kena hakikatnya kelulusan dia hanya dibuat pada 25 Februari 2021, iaitu kelulusan pengecualian cukai yang di luar kebiasaannya yang melibatkan kedua-dua yayasan Al Bukhari dan kumpulan Al Bukhari. In answering to Rasa MP Cha Ki Chin's question in the Dewan Rakyat, Datuk Sri Anwar said Yayasan Al Bukhari was given tax exemption under subsection 44, subsection 6 of the Income Tax Act 1997 or Act 53, which is exempted from income tax. The tax exemption was given to institution established not for the purpose of seeking profit and solely established for charitable purposes. The Premier added that only the Inland Revenue Board's Director General has the power to revoke any tax exemption. The Communications and Digital Ministry KKD supports efforts made by the filming industry players to bring virtual production equipment into the country, which could become a game changer to the industry. Its minister, Fami Fazil, said it was timely with the provision of 102 million ringgit under budget 2023, among others, and compassed import duty and sales tax exemptions on studio and filming production equipment. Production stage. Ya, saya ada bincang dengan uh, Datuk Sri Zainal. Uh, beliau ada nyatakan hasrat untuk membawa masuk peralatan seperti itu. Bagi saya, uh, ia bertepatan dengan uh, pengumuman Perdana Menteri tentang pelepasan cukai bagi uh, ataupun duty uh, import bagi peralatan uh, studio. Uh, saya lihat sekiranya mampu kita bawa dan kita manfaatkan sepenuhnya ia mampu menjadi satu berkemungkinan menjadi satu game changer
Speaking after officiating the National Artist Day 2023 last night, the minister expressed confidence in the creative industry, especially the film industry, to continue growing as a creative economic engine, like foreign countries such as South Korea, China, Japan and the United States. Through the sector, he said the government via KKD and FINAS can continue to increase foreign investment into the country through the Film in Malaysia Incentive FIMI and International Co-Production Treaty with with countries such as China, Korea and Indonesia. The National Artist Day is now celebrated on 22nd March every year and it was chosen to commemorate with the birth date of the late Tan Sri P. Ramli as a way of remembering and appreciating the services and devotion of the late film legend. <laughs> The government intends to return the Kuala Lumpur International Airport, KLIA, to the top 10 of Skytrax's world airport rankings. Transport Minister Anthony Lok said as part of the efforts to achieve this aspiration, all relevant parties should pay attention to maintaining and upgrading operation systems such as the aerotrain and the baggage handling system. Yeah. Uh, Kedua-dua komponen ini amat penting kepada perkhidmatan lapangan terbang kerana bagi seorang penumpang yang pentingnya apabila mereka uh, berlepas ataupun mendarat di satu lapangan terbang apa yang paling penting? Yang pentingnya mereka kena sampai daripada pintu masuk lapangan terbang sampai ke uh, pesawat mereka dengan satu perjalanan yang lancar yang cepat yang keduanya Apabila mereka mendarat, mereka nak ambil bagasi mereka dalam keadaan yang segera. The minister said this after the official launch of KLIA's Plaza Premium Lounge. Logue said KLIA ranked 67th in Skytrax as world's top 100 airports for 2023, falling five rungs from 62nd in 2022. He said attention must be given to the trend of falling rankings and this must be corrected to present a good image internationally. KLIA's highest ranking was number two in 2001 before falling to 14th in 2013 and 44th in 2018. Logue also said he had noted the grievances of passengers and tourists concerning the suspension of the aerotrain service and that action had been taken to upgrade the shuttle bus service. Flood mitigation projects to be expedited to reduce the impact next year. Stay tuned. Implementation of flood mitigation projects will be expedited to reduce the impact of the disaster in the country. Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim said Secretary General of Treasury Dato Johan Mahmud Merikan had been instructed to take action to expedite the flood mitigation projects. Langkah-langkah yang lain seperti tebatan banjir itu saya minta perbandaran KSP pada untuk menyegerakan. Ya, proses tender segera supaya dapat mengurangkan tekanan untuk tahun-tahun uh, akan datang insyaallah The Prime Minister was speaking when flagging off the post-flood civil service volunteer team PSPA to Johor in Putrajaya this morning. A total of 1,520 civil servants representing various ministries, departments and government agencies are participating in the two-day post-flood mission, particularly in areas in the Batu Pahat district. According to a statement issued by the Prime Minister's department JPM in conjunction with today's event, the mission will focus on the cleaning of medical and educational facilities, government buildings and public places. At the event today, Datuk Sri Anwar expressed his appreciation to civil servants who participated in the post-flood mission in Johor. Datuk Sri Anwar said students and non-governmental organisations, NGOs, should also assist in the post-flood mission in Johor. 
The flood situation in Batu Pahat shows a positive development with the number of victims at Temporary Evacuation Centres, PPS, continuing to decrease as of 8 a.m. today. According to the State Disaster Management Committee, JPBN, a total of 6,740 people are still at 43 PPS, compared to 7,972 people at 44 PPS at 8 p.m. yesterday. The PPS with the highest number of evacuees is Kola Junis Kabangs and China Li Chun with 522 victims, followed by SJKC Chonghua Kangkar Senangar, 402 people, and Skola Kabangs and Sri Medan, 399 people. The weather is forecast to be fine in all 10 districts in the state this morning. The water in three rivers is still at the warning level, namely at Beko Dam involving Sungai Beko, Sembrong Dam at Sungai Sembrong and Sengarang River in Sengarang. Johor Menteri Besar Dato On Hafiz Ghazi was reported to have said that the state government was intensifying its efforts to deal with the stagnant of flood waters phase and hoped the problem could be resolved before the arrival of Ramadan. The monsoon transition phase is expected to begin on 23rd March and continue until mid-May, marking the end of the northeast monsoon, which began on 7th November last year. Malaysian Meteorological Department Met Malaysia Director General Mohamed Helmi Abdullah in a statement said, during this phase, the country will receive weak winds from various directions, which would form thunderstorms that usually bring heavy rain and strong winds in a short period. According to Mohamed Helmi, the thunderstorms would normally happen in the afternoon and late evening in most areas on the west coast and interiors of the peninsula, western Sabah, as well as central Sarawak. He said these conditions have the potential of causing flash floods and damage to unstable structures. As such, Mohamed Helmi advised the public to be more vigilant during this period, besides always keeping updated with the weather forecasts and warnings issued via Met Malaysia's official website, My Chuacha Mobile application and social media platforms. The public can also call Met Malaysia's hotline number at 1300 221638 for further inquiries. At a European Union led conference, pledged a 7 billion euros to help to rebuild Turkey. That and more in a foreign segment. Chinese President Xi Jinping met with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin at the Kremlin on his arrival in Moscow on Monday, talking about subjects including bilateral ties and the Ukraine crisis. When Xi reached the Kremlin, Putin warmly shook hands and took photos with Xi. The two presidents had an in-depth and candid exchange on China-Russia relations and issues of mutual interest. With concerted efforts by both sides, Russia-China relations in recent years have delivered fruitful results in various areas. Putin said Russia stands ready to continue to deepen bilateral practical cooperation, step up communication and collaboration in international affairs with China. The two sides also had an in-depth exchange of views on the Ukraine issue. C stressed that on the Ukraine issue, voices for peace and rationality are building with most countries' support, easing tensions, stand for peace talks and are against adding fuel to the fire. China released a document on its position on the Ukraine crisis, advocating the political settlement of the crisis and rejecting the Cold War mentality and unilateral sanctions. The two presidents said that they look forward to formal talks on the next day to draw up a new blueprint for China-Russia comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination in the years to come. 
Macedonia's at a European Union-led conference on Monday pledged 7 billion euros to help to rebuild Turkey after last month's devastating earthquakes, while Ankara estimated the costs at more than 10 times that. The earthquakes that shook Turkey on 6 February were the worst natural disaster to strike modern-day Turkey, with more than 56,000 people killed in Turkey and neighbouring Syria. The European Union and member country Sweden on Monday hosted the conference to drum up support where the total pledges amount to 7 billion euros. Sweden's Prime Minister Ulf Christensen said the money would help people whose lives were destroyed in a matter of seconds and minutes. The EU has long accused Erdogan of human rights violations and the bloc's ties with Turkey are strained over Ankara's crackdown on dissent following a 2016 coup. More recently, Turkey has blocked a bid by Sweden to join NATO in the wake of Russia's war against Ukraine. But the EU said it mobilized several million euros of immediate help and sent more than 1,500 rescuers to help in the hours and days following the earthquake in Turkey, which also hosts several million refugees from the war in Syria. EU officials said the donor conference included some 400 international actors, countries, regional organizations and non-governmental groups. The French government under President Emmanuel Macron on Monday survived two no-confidence motions in Parliament but still faced intense pressure over its handling of a controversial pensions reform. The outcome prompted immediate anti-government protests with 101 people arrested in Paris alone, intense standoffs between protesters and security forces. Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne incensed the opposition last week by announcing the government would impose the pension reform without a parliamentary vote, sparking accusations of anti-democratic behaviour. The opposition filed two motions of no confidence in the government as a result. The 577-seat National Assembly Lower House rejected the first motion by a margin of just nine votes. It then overwhelmingly rejected a motion brought by the far-right National Rally RN with just 94 votes in favour. The rejection of the motions means that the reform to raise the pensions age from 62 to 64 has now been adopted by the legislature. Spontaneous protests erupted in the centre of Paris with protesters setting fire to bins and clashing with police who used tear gas to clear some areas, with similar scenes were reported in other French cities including Dijon and Strasbourg. A new round of strikes and protests has been called and are expected to again bring public transport to a standstill in several areas. There has been a rolling strike by rubbish collectors in Paris, leading to unsightly and unhygienic piles of trash accumulating in the French capital. A French journalist kidnapped nearly two years ago by a terrorist group in the Sahel and a US aid worker held by them for six years arrived in the Niger capital Niamey on Monday after being released. French freelancer Olivier Dubois, 48, was kidnapped in Mali on April 2021, while American aid worker Jeffrey Woodke went missing in Niger in October 2016. Dubois began working as a freelance journalist in Mali in 2015, working for the daily Liberation and the news weekly Le Point. He himself announced his abduction in a video posted on social networks on 5th May 2021. In it, he said he had been kidnapped in the northern Malian city of Gao by a terrorist group which has connection to Al-Qaeda. Meanwhile, Wodke was seized at gunpoint from his home in Abalak in the Tahua region of southwestern Niger, about 350 kilometers from the army. The 61-year-old had served as a missionary and humanitarian aid worker in Niger for 32 years. French President Emmanuel Macron, in a statement released after he had spoken to Dubois, expressed his huge relief and said the journalist would soon be back in France. U.S. President Joe Biden welcomed the freeing of Woodke and thanked the government of Niger, calling it a critical partner in helping to secure his release. Details about why or how the pair were released were not given. 
Amazon.com Inc. on Monday said it would cut 9,000 jobs, making it the latest big tech company to announce a second round of layoffs in the face of a possible recession. Numerous tech giants, including Microsoft Corp, Salesforce Inc., Alphabet and Meta platforms, have slashed thousands of jobs in recent months after pandemic-led hiring sprees left them overstaffed. Amazon follows Facebook parent Meta in becoming the second bellwether to announce a second round of cuts. CEO Andy Jassy said the company had added a substantial amount of staff in the past few years, but the uncertain economy has forced it to choose cost and headcount cuts, which will be concentrated in its cloud services, advertising and Twitch units. Amazon last month said operating profit may continue to slump in the current quarter, hit by the financial financial impact of consumers and cloud customers clamping down on spending. Sales from its lucrative cloud computing division slowed during the fourth quarter. Amazon has scaled back or shut down entire services like its virtual primary care offering for employers. Shares of Amazon were down 1.4% in morning trading on the Nasdaq. Facebook parent Meta Platform said it would cut 10,000 jobs this year following the first mass layoff in the fall, which eliminated more than 11,000 jobs. In sports, Ronaldo begins training with Portugal for Euro 2024. Stay tuned. Kedah Darul Aman winger Mohamed Fayyad Mohamed Zulkifli Amin wants to capitalise on the call-up to join the national squad centralised training camp by national head coach Kim Pangon. Fayyad, 25, said he was aware that he would have to be in his best physical condition to compete against the more established players, but added that he was hoping to repay the confidence of the South Korean coach. Kalau dari fizikal tu mungkin cabaran lah sebab nak jumpa dengan player-player yang badan fizikal yang besar. Mungkin itu tak menjadi halangan untuk menjadi seorang yang terbaik lah. Mungkin dari segi saya punya confident kot yang membeli coach Kim Panggon panggil saya. Dan insyaAllah saya akan bantu sebuah sedikit untuk tim Malaysia kali ini. Dan mungkin terbaik untuk improve saya punya game untuk dalam tim Kedah. Fayad was among 27 players called up for centralised training by the South Korean coach to prepare his squad for two international Tier 1 friendly matches against Turkmenistan on 23rd March and Hong Kong 28th March at the Sultan Ibrahim Stadium in Iskandar Putri, Johor. Cristiano Ronaldo was included in the first 11 Portugal squad announced by new coach Roberto Martinez for Euro 2024 qualifying matches against Liechtenstein and Luxembourg. Martinez stressed that the 38-year-old is very important for the team as the match is the starting point for Euro 2024. Ronaldo, whose international career began in August 2003 in a friendly against Kazakhstan, holds the world record for international goals with 118. History suggests that if he returns to the starting lineup, he will boost his total in the next two matches, at least against Luxembourg. Portugal have played Liechtenstein seven times, winning six and drawing one, a World Cup qualifier in 2004, which Ronaldo started but did not finish. They have outscored Liechtenstein 35-3, but Ronaldo has never scored against the Principality. Portugal have faced Luxembourg 19 times, winning 17 and losing just one, outscoring them 59-8. Ronaldo has represented Portugal in every international competition since Euro 2004, collecting a European Championship winner's medal in 2016. His quest to add a World Cup medal in Qatar last year ended in tears after Portugal lost to Morocco in the quarterfinals. 
The German national football team took to the training pitch on Monday ahead of their friendly against Peru on Saturday. Fans greeted the team with applause, even as some expressed skepticism about the state of German football after a disappointing FIFA World Cup in Qatar that saw the team exit during the group phase. Head coach Hansi Flick expressed his hope for his youthful squad during a press conference. He said there is huge potential in the players, but the question remains on how to manifest it on the pitch. Germany and Peru meet for a third time on Saturday, with Germany currently ranked 14 in the FIFA rankings. Favoured to start their post-Qatar 2022 era with a win. Fans said the change in leadership which saw former player and 1990s world champion Rudy Voller take over from Oliver Biroff as the national team director in early December 2022 was good, but they remain skeptic on 2024 European Championship prospect. In cycling, Primoz Roglic from Jumbo Visma edged a Remco Evenepoel of Saudal quick step in an uphill drag race to win stage one at Volta Ciclista Catalunya, although his win was overshadowed by a nasty crash in the closing stages. It was a thrilling showdown between the two favourites for the Giro d'Italia in May. Roglic was first to launch his sprint in a lively finale, holding on for victory, leaving fast-finishing Evenepoel in frustration. Roglic leads Evenepoel in the general classification by four seconds, courtesy of the time bonuses. Adam Yates, UAE Team Emirates, Dario Cataldo, Trek Segafredo, Michael Stora, Grupama FDJ, Christian Sparagli, Aplechen De Shunik, and Anthony De Laples, IKEA Samsic, were among those to hit the deck after a scary cascade effect in the peloton just minutes after the remnants of the day's breakaway had been hoovered up. Cataldo sustained multiple fractures as a result of the crash and was taken to hospital. Stora, Sparagli and De La Place all finished the stage around nine minutes after Roglic having suffered varying degrees of injuries. Former Volta Ciclista a Catalunya champion Yates came in 10 minutes and 35 seconds behind Roglic. The FIA said yesterday it intends to address the problems at last weekend Saudi Arabia Grand Prix where Fernando Alonso was handed a punishment at the end of the race that was later overturned. The message said the topic would be addressed at a FIA committee meeting on 23rd March and promised a clarification will be issued ahead of the Australian Grand Prix, which is on 2nd April in Melbourne. Alonso was first punished for not starting from the right spot on the grid. The Aston Martin driver tried to serve his five-second penalty at the start of a pit stop, but a mechanic allowed a jack to touch the car. After the race finished and Alonso had stood on the podium and given interviews, the stewards, who are nominated by the FIA, finally decided that the team had been working on Alonso's car during the penalty. They hit the Spaniard with a 10-second penalty, dropping him to fourth behind George Russell. Aston Martin appealed and produced videos showing that other competitors had done the same in the past without being sanctioned. The decision was the result of new evidence regarding the definition of working on the car, for which there were conflicting precedents. And this has been exposed by this specific circumstance, says the FIA spokesperson. And with that, we reach the end of today's updates at noon. In our top story today, proposal to allow EPF savings as collateral for bank loans, not against Section 51 of the EPF Act. And don't forget to tune in to News at 10 tonight for more news. And before we go, we will leave you with a clip of thousands of visiting Mexico's Teotihuacan ruins on Monday. Many dressed in white climbed the towering pyramid on the sun to celebrate and to bask in the first sunlight of the solar new year. Till then, I'm Renee Fong. Have a pleasant day.